ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are ready to start, so please take your seat. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Welcome to EASA, uh, welcome uh, to our workshop on the operation in the open and uh, specific category. I am Natale Di Rubo, I am uh, the regulation officer uh, for uh, this activity on drone and uh, the coordinator of the MPA that uh, was developed by the, a team from EASA, uh, not only from EASA but also uh, with uh, the great contribution from the European Commission and today we have also the Commission, DG Grow and DG Move uh, that will make a presentation and uh, a, an expert group made by um, authorities, industry and operators. So before starting, some administrative information. Uh, this is the plan of the, the area where uh, we are now. We are in the, the blue area, the Airbus uh, meeting room and the uh, emergency exit are uh, straight on the right or on the left. Uh, we have a restroom on the, on the left and also if you go straight. And uh, lunch, lunch and breaks uh, will be served um, just straight you when you exit from this room uh, in, the in the area where it uh, is highlighted in um, uh, orange in the map. So, so the agenda has been published on the website. Uh, all of you already, I, th I think you already saw. Uh, we have many topics to be covered today. Uh, so I we will try to respect time, uh, the schedule, and ask also you to respect the time of uh, breaks and of lunch. Um, the we will have also today web streaming. So welcome also to the uh, the, the people connected via web. And uh, um, so I ask you when you uh, ask question to wait for the microphone and speak on to the microphone. Uh, today uh, we also are using Slido uh, in order to provide to allow you to provide uh, uh, comments or questions. Uh, actually, we already received a number of questions in the last days, and uh, uh, we are going out to archive those questions. And you uh, can find on uh, our website a, a document with all the answers to the questions received up to this morning at 30. Okay, and uh, she's going to be presented today has been developed also through the uh, contributions of an expert group. And this has been very important to pull this together. Uh, many of you are in the room today. Uh, perhaps you could just put up your hands. Uh, just I'm testing that I'm being told the right thing here. Okay, so these people have been directly involved in developing this. Thank you. So you can see who they are. In terms of where we are in the process, um, the basic regulation is currently under review, which will consider giving the competence for the regulation of UAS to the European system, and will share out the roles between EASA, the Commission, the national authorities, and uh, so on. Uh, it's uh, the uh, discussions are with the um, Commission, Parliament and Council at the moment, so we uh, are watching very carefully to see what comes from that. But we're very positive, we think that the result will be uh, to confirm the competence to uh, be shared amongst those organisations. And that is specifically to add the regulation of UAS uh, under 150 kilograms. We consider it's imperative that we develop these rules as soon as possible. You can see the uh, UAS technology developing, uh, the market is opening up, 
and the use is increasing at a rapid rate. We need the regulations urgently, and that's why we started the activity before th the basic regulation has been finalized. The stakeholders, many amongst you today, cover a very diverse and large community. And we need your experiences. They cover a huge amount of different uh, domains. In fact, I think in my three decades in safety regulation, I've never seen a rulemaking task which has covered such a wide breadth of stakeholders. Many people here, probably even today, um, are not traditionally from the aviation background. You bring new concepts and technologies to our system. It's very important that we take account of all of that and join it together. We've got many topics on the agenda, and so please uh, keep to the timing as far as you can, and we will keep the break short to make best use of our time. The technology that you are developing and you, you are going to operate is going to find its way also into conventional aircraft in the longer term. And it's important as well that we learn how to enable technology to improve safety through this. This is a great opportunity for us wider than in the UAS domain. And we're learning about that through, through this rulemaking task. It's imperative that we join up the complete system. And we're going to learn a lot about joining up the complete system, not only for UAS, but for other more conventional aircraft. And more importantly, because of the diverse community, we're learning a lot about how to involve and consult stakeholders. And that's really at the heart of what we're doing here today. So please take part in the discussion. Get the best value from it as you can. Contribute. Answer those questions. Does it cover your needs? And is it proportionate and risk-based enough? So with that, it's a pleasure for me to open this discussion today. And I hope you enjoy it and it's a success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Okay, now uh, we'll start with the first presentation uh, from uh, DG Move. So, Mr. Kundevos, thank you. Thank you, Natale. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What a pleasure to see so many people for such interesting topic and great to have also the, the remote control. Today, we're going to discuss an important piece of a bigger puzzle. And we will focus on that little piece, but in order to set the scene, to see the importance of this piece and what shape this piece should have, uh, sh are, are we sufficiently operation-centric and so on, we need to have the overview picture of, of the puzzle that we try to make at the end of the day. We want to work towards a drone service market. So what pieces do we have to put in place to achieve at the end a drone service market to create jobs and growth because that is the final goal and why is this technology and this drone issue so important because the drone technologies forget about the little drones and and see what is behind we have to look at the underlying technologies which will enable further steps in automation and this automation will bring at the end of the day, the bigger picture of digitization, everything becomes more and more digitized. We're working towards more decarbonization of our transport. We work on the Internet of Things and so on. And that's why the drones topic is so important and will be high on the political agenda. So that's why the MPA that we will be s discussing today is so important because it opens the way it is important piece in this overall picture. So, 
when we talk about the drone services, what exactly, what will be the size of the market? And you have so many market studies around. On the internet, you just have to Google. And you will find big, big differences. And all depends of, you have the, the conservative estimates, 10 billions in, in, in 35, uh, or you have the more optimistic forecast who say, yeah, but in, in a couple of years, you already have more than 100 billion. Whatever the market studies are saying, it will be huge and it will be drastic, especially if you link it to the big, bigger picture of decarbonization, digitization, and so on. So that's the size of the market as such is, it is important, but look at the bigger picture. And we know that this whole technology is disruptive. We know that we want to embrace this technology. So at the end of the day, when Trevor asked, do we get it right? And do we get it really focused on the risk and, and operation centric? What we really want to achieve is that we want to keep the threshold as low as possible that industry can embrace this new technology and start can start using it. Yet, if you talk to your friends or your family with on drones, you always raise some concerns. So in our policy, we have to make sure that we strike a, a very delicate balance between embracing the technology and protecting the people and make sure that in the MPA also, we have the tools in place to protect those societal, to, to tackle those societal concerns. And what can we do not only about safety, but also make a link with security, privacy, or even noise. We, we must make sure that we don't replace noisy vans in the street with noisy drones in the air. That could be even more annoying. So these things, we have to keep that in mind to make sure that this disruptive technology will be really enter the market. So what, oops, what are we doing to tackle this new technology and embrace this new technology? You could say we are using all our tool, the commission is using all its tools to put it uh, and to, to materialize it. We are using our regulatory tools. And one of the main products we will be discussing today, that is a regulatory tool instrument that we are making available. But this is only a piece which fits in the wider regulatory framework, which we promised to, to establish by 2019. Not all the pieces will be there, but at least we would like to see European drone operations in place by 2019. That was a declaration made in Warsaw last year, but that is our timetable, our roadmap. And that regulatory framework will also include new space. We are also, beyond the regulatory tools, we are also using our funding tools. We are putting CESAR in a position that they will able to, to finance drone specific projects. And that really is done about the integration of drones in the wider aviation system. And the third tool that we are using is the coordination mechanism and the dialogue between member states, between industry, like today, and in general, to make sure that there is a good coordination of who is doing what, and above all, to create that investment climate that the businesses have confidence that they can start to operate drone services and invest in these technologies and create jobs and growth in this industry. So I'm coming now to the more substantive slides. If you look at the governance, who is doing what, this is a very dense slide on, on the governance. You see, we are working with the member states and industry to make sure that we have the regulatory framework in place. That's our task, to have at least the European competence that we can pursue a coherent drone policy that fits into the wider commission policy towards 
decarbonization, digitization, and so on, to be relevant for the European citizens, relevant for the daily lives of our citizens. In the rule, under the rulemaking pillar, we see a lead role for EASA, and that is today the, the symbol of it, that they work, they reach out to the industry to make sure that we have it right, or about right, because at the end of the day, nobody will be perfectly happy with the outcome, but the most important is that we put an important step towards this future, and this is our future. And I guess that EASA will in future also put in place some other expert groups to deal with other patches or other pieces of this bigger puzzle. We also have in the stream of research and development, CESAR is working on the integration. They are elaborating a bigger vision on how to integrate drones in the wider aviation system by amending the ATM master plan to make sure that the, the vision on how to integrate drones in the wider aviation system is well on the political table and is well reflected in all the projects that will be financed in the future through Europe, focusing on the integration of drones into the aviation system. And then in order to make sure that the drones operations can really start, we also I look at industry, to which extent are they able or is industry able to complete our performance-based rules with standards, to come up with concrete solutions on how to meet the performance standards or the performance objectives that we lay down in our rules. So you see, this morning Trevor mentioned the team, but the team is very, very wide and everybody must contribute. And that's why you must have a good overview of all the actions that should be overtaken, that everybody knows exactly where is this place and what is expected from each other. And then a final slide on, on what is the overview of delivery? W what are we expected to deliver? Currently also like Trevor already mentioned, the legal basis are to get the competence to regulate drones, regardless of weight, is still on the table of Council and Parliament. It is taking a little bit longer because the drone rules is forms part of a wider package of review of the European basic European safety rules, and some are quite delicate, so it takes a little bit more time than expected. But, but it's coming and we hope that the Estonians will be able to secure a political agreement with the Parliament that we have a sound legal basis. So we have a legal basis then to regulate drones regardless of weight. We will also see the delivery of more technical rules. EASA is, is doing a great job. This NPA is, is not a little step, it's a leap forward and it is disruptive. This technology is disruptive, not only for industry, for traditional stakeholders, but it is also disruptive for regulators because we have to move from an aircraft-centric approach toward an operation-centric approach. And that is easily said, but what exactly does it entail? That is not so easy. And that's why we are trying to get it right, to make sure that we really move towards that direction. One minute, great. We also are looking to towards validated solutions that coming from CESAR, that those technologies really function and can that we better organize the flow of the process of maturing with technologies, validation of these technologies, development of standards, and then the delivery of requirements. You see, it is much work ahead of us, but we have a great team and you all are part of it. Thank you very much indeed for your attention and have a good discussion day today. Thank you. Thank you, Kuhn. Uh, now the, the background will be completed by our impact assessment officer, Alessandro Canizzaro.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, my name is Alessandro Canizzaro, Impact Assessment Officer here. Before I go ahead with the slide, just um, uh, very briefly, this is a presentation to show a bit the structure of the impact assessment. We will not go in the details of the, of the, of the text. The main purpose is to help you, to guide you when you will go, and you perhaps you already went through, but or when you will go through the document to understand how this is structured. Anyhow, I'll be here throughout the whole day, and there will be also links to the impact assessment throughout the presentation. So feel free also to ask questions related to this uh, afterwards as well. So uh, purpose of the impact assessment. The impact assessment is a quantitative and qualitative analysis, so both aspects are very important, based on which the most beneficial option is proposed. So we have a preferred option in the impact assessment, and the conclusion by saying that this is preferred option is backed up by the uh, reasoning included in the document, in the analysis, in, in the impact assessment. This is a clear case of evidence-based policy making because uh, the document includes quite um, in-depth analysis, both quantitative and qualitative, and allows an understanding of the various impacts of all the analyzed options. So all the retained options, you will see there is an in-depth analysis which looks at several criteria. Here I mentioned an example, for instance, safety, but not only. We look, of course, at economic criteria, to so understand, for instance, costs and benefits for manufacturers with an additional, for instance, technical requirement, or social aspects, for instance, additional resources needed by authorities to do a specific task. Structure of the MPA. There is um, the first very important chapter of the document is the problem definition. So we try with the problem definition to provide an, a very detailed analysis of what the real problem is. Before focusing on the main issues, uh, which are highlighted in the document, we try to um, highlight which are the existing actions. So before we propose something new, let's see what actually is going on at the European level, but also at national level. Mm, so you see there is actually an overview of um, the current uh, regulatory system in several member states included in the analysis. Several initiatives, not just rulemaking, we include also linked to safety promotion activities and so on. We include the problem tree. The main purpose of the problem tree is to help uh, to facilitate the visualization of the problem, so the issues, mm, which we uh, describe in details, we have seven in total. But also we try to understand which are the drivers, the root causes of this issue. Why do we have this issue? And the consequence, so what is the outcome? For instance, uh, could be safety concerns or also barriers to the market, so economic concerns. Once we define the problem, then we try to see what kind of solution we can have to solve this problem. So we include packages of options for open, spe specific, and registration. You see there are chapters by open, specific, and registration, and within each chapter you have the options, so again, ways to solve the problem which we mentioned in the first chapter, and the analysis of the impacts of the options so of the solution that we propose. Um, I say also for each retained option because we include also some discarded option and in the text is explained why no in-depth analysis has been done for those discarded option. Analysis of impacts is done according to the criteria which I mentioned in the previous slides, for instance, social aspects, economic, safety and so on. As I mentioned, it is indeed a clear case of evidence-based policy making. We have, uh, we launched several questionnaires tackling mostly affected stakeholders. You see we send questionnaires to operators, manufacturers, authorities, training school, model aircraft association. Additionally, of course, the comments on prototype rules, for instance, were very useful. Um, and all the information we got uh, were taken into consideration and um, were fundamental in order to understand the impacts for uh, several stakeholders. Now you wonder, is it really an issue? So we try to un understand in the problem definition uh, before we try to propose solution, do we really need to have do we need to have to act, or is it really an issue? So here we just provide a snapshot uh, of few graphs. The document is quite uh, detailed. You see also reference to other aspects. This is focused on the uh, safety aspects. Mm -hmm. 
uh, with a paragraph on safety risk assessment which shows several graphs. These actually, by the way, are the most, even more updated, fresh uh, graphs from the recently published annual safety review. So you see, uh, we showed that there's a boom in number of currencies. You see the boom in 2016. And the second graph, um, the message I would like to deliver there is, is actually there is a high risk of collision with demand aircraft because you can see that many of these occurrences represented in the graph below happened at a uh, very high altitude. So we started with the problem tree. Don't worry, we're not going into the details of this graph, uh, but this is a result of a brainstorming activity. So as I mentioned before, we try to see the issues. We try to see what are the root causes of these, the drivers, and the consequences. I will go through a more detailed uh, example afterwards. So starting from this problem tree, we map very well what the problem is. Now we go to the second graph. So you see those problems we mentioned as issue in the previous graph are now uh, to in the left part. Then we ask ourselves, what do we want to achieve? So we put next to it the, the objective, okay? And we propose solutions, so the options, option one, two, and three, this is related to the open category. Let's focus on one. For instance, let's say the issue is inadequate competences. Uh, the driver, one of the drivers, by the way, was, for instance, the fact that we have new actors in the market, non-expert in the aviation world. So we could have inadequate competences. What is our objective? So we say we ensure a proportion and adequate level of competences, and we propose solutions through the options, okay? You see uh, elements like online training exam and so on. Again, this is really an example of evidence-based because we use information, for instance, from that we receive from training schools to understand what is the cost of training, to, uh, to see, uh, to, to understand what would be the impact by including, uh, for instance, uh, online training or certificate of competence in one option or another? What could be the impact for operators, for instance, the cost to do such a course? I'll just conclude saying <laughs> to questions. Please, that um, we're facing more and more um, in your everyday work, um, the drone market is emerging and growing, and it is clear that um, we should act, and we should act now. Uh, so it was also recognized in uh, aviation strategy and it was also recognized in Warsaw Declaration on Drones. And in Warsaw Conference, uh, Commissioner as well um, herself announced uh, this concept of use space. Uh, after the Warsaw Conference, SGU has been tasked to develop a use space vision and blueprint of use space and I emphasize vision. Uh, so we start to do that work. It support our work on the uh, ATM master plan update and looking on the safe integration of the drones. Uh, do doing that, we have uh, quite a lot of consultation with the drone community, uh, with the stakeholders. We have different working groups and quite um, vital, quite uh, interesting discussions we had. We have like a lot of bilateral visits with a lot of you. Uh, so by the end of April, the blueprint was endorsed by the European Commission. You can see the link uh, as well. And it was also the official press release um, attached to this. So it's not a big document, it's just a vision. It's five pages, so you can read it easily and you can find it on the link that is in the slides. So blueprint content, uh, so the questions we ask ourselves and probably you ask uh, yourselves now when I'm presenting this, why and what is Uspace? <laughs> and uh, what is the key services that Uspace can provide? As well, uh, how uh, do drones operate in the Uspace? And how we also to ensure a progressive rollout of the Uspace? not having all services and bunch at one moment of time, but have really roadmap and progressive rollout, rollout of those services. So this is the definition that we come up in our blueprint. Uh, you can read it and you can see that it's mostly the key word is the new services. It's a set of new services. Uh, and it's relying on high-level digitalization and automation. So 
the U space is capable of, of ensuring um, smooth operations in all operating environments, all types of airspace, all kinds of missions, all categories of drones, and all drone users. That is the definition we put in the U space vision, and that is agreed with the most of the stakeholders we have been consulting. So as the use space concept will grow, we see that the smart cities, or are we talking about air mobility in the picture you can see as well, uh, we didn't put that in vain, uh, that could be part of the use space in the future. So uh, now I'm just giving you a little story, uh, and again, it's a vision how we've seen it. Uh, really, the use space to be operational. So you can see like a little Google map and uh, a smartphone, it's not marketing for the smartphones, but it's just showing you that we see that the um, use space will be based on automatization and digitalization. So um, the drone operator plans to fly a drone, for example, to carry a small package from a village to the city. So she uses information sharing services to prepare the flight. You can see as well the some services indicated. Uh, so you can also see a little bubble uh, around the airport and it's a restricted area. So this is the information she gets in preparation her little mission. So the next step is submission of flight request so uh, the planned flight um, uh, does in fact conflict with the several other planned um, drone operations. So the operator at this time offering other possibilities. So uh, the she chooses uh, one option and receives the acknowledgement. And when the drone is airborne, it receives information and alerts. Again, you can see the list of services you can use at this stage. So execution of the flight. So there you can see a lot of information already because it's probably the most important phase uh, that is happening. So um, our drone is equipped with uh, detect and avoid capabilities, uh, which alerts it to avoid uh, hazards. You can see a little crane also in the picture. Um, and it's uh, an obstacles, and the drone uh, detect and avoid it. But it was not previously in our little Google Maps indicated, but drone automatically detect and avoid, and further communicate these obstacles to the other drones and also to the use space services. So when our the drone continues uh, flight, the other, um, the, the other uh, even happens. So you can see that um, it receives alert on the modification of airspace availability. Why? Because there is car accident happen and police set um, a temporary restricted area. So it means that um, the drone should change the route. And of course, the priority will be given to the um, medical helicopter or the helicopter who will arrive in the place of accident. So um, uh, the drone uh, will be route around this pass and our drone will be, enable, will be able to finish his mission. So the mission will be completed, drone will uh, arrive safely on its destination and delivers parcel and can be ready for the next mission. So that's a little story, a little vision that we really see in our uh, vision uh, strategy and we, uh, as from the um, research and development side, we should work on the capabilities of technologies to make it happen. 
So remember that I had the, the before some slides, I had the definition of use space. So um, this is to show you the group of services that we propose to, to, to achieve the goal of full operating deployable use space. So you can see that U1 services is foundation and it is registration, identification and geo information. And that's why are we here invited to YASA MPA because those services are content wise are complying with the YASA proposed MPA. They has been discussed with YASA as well and YASA has part as well on our developing our use space concept. So we think that foundation services from technical point is ready, from regulatory point depending on the NPA. U2 services uh, support the management of the drone operations. And you can see that they already have much more services and include uh, much more a bit complex services. On U3 phase, services support more complex operations in dense areas. As we could say for you too, we need, in a, from technical point of view, we need only some demonstrations to see that those services are really working and could be put on deployment. Then for U3 in CESAR, um, in SGU, we need some more research and uh, activities to really see on the research phase uh, how those services and what kind of requirements can be put on the place. So U3 block asking for more effort and more time also from research and development point. So it's also include dynamic geofencing, interface uh, inter, uh, with ATC, so uh, manned aviation in general as well. And of course U4 is a full use space reached. Rolling out the use space, probably this is also a question what you ask, how it could be possible. For U1, uh, as I said, as it compliant, uh, already technological development allows those services and it's only depend from regulatory point of the NPA, we see that they could be available already 2019. U2 services, as I said, there is needed more demonstration part from research and development point on some services and they could be available as well from technological point quite soon, then it need more regulatory and standardization work if needed. U3, there is still quite a lot of work should be done on a research uh, side, so we have a bit more timeline for this. So what I want to say on this slide is quite important. So main drivers of the use space, as I already <coughs> emphasized, is level of automation and level of connectivity. So if we stuck on that in some of the phases, probably we can't go further with services as well. So we are really relying on those two main drivers on this. And this probably will be my last slide. <coughs> Just what is the next steps? What will be tomorrow, after tomorrow? And on the Christmas. So uh, this um, showing you that the main thing that we want to finish by the end of October to really um, refinement of use space roadmap and insertion in, insertion in the European ATM master plan update. And it will include both parts, drones in controlled airspace and also use space vision. But again, I emphasize it will be vision as well uh, together with the roadmaps, but still much more work should be done still in the, as well as technological side, as well from regulatory side. Then we have a big event, and this is a bit of marketing. On 8th of November in Tallinn, uh, together with the Estonian presidency, uh, in framework of digital transportation days, where we will present the ATM master plan update and we'll start ITM master plan campaign and we put as well the drone uh, topic as one topic forward. And then you probably all know there will be famous uh, drone conference in Helsinki in 21st and 22nd of November. 
where a commissioner probably will come up with the use space concept to be developed further. So thank you, and for the questions, probably my colleague uh, from the commission who was very deeply involved in use space development, and, and also Yasa colleagues who was very involved can assist. Uh, Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, uh, Olivier from uh, Sapri Italia. Uh, just a question to both uh, Cesar and uh, Impact Assessment. As uh, we know, uh, it was a recommendation to the Commission on civil law rules on uh, robotics done by uh, Madi Delvo. So my my questions is uh, in. Automation is, is, is a thing. Business is a thing and a job is a thing. Uh, it seems that we, uh, co uh, we, we contemplate the fact that the, the business is automatically with jobs. But with the digitization, this is not, this is not uh, obvious. So what's the position of the Commission about that? And is it assess assessed uh, this part of uh, uh, the human and the creation of real jobs for, for, for the persons? Thank you for this very interesting question. Uh, and, and I think we have to put this question into a wider context of to which extent will those new technologies like introduction of a PC in the time bring us better or, or more jobs. And if you look at when the times when the PC was introduced, many people feared, oh, everybody will be out of job. Now with the introduction of the PC, 10 10, 20 years ago, um, I have the impression that everybody is so overwhelmed by work. So we think, and in general, we think that there will be a shift in the nature of the jobs, whereby we see more and more how technology will assist people in doing their jobs differently. The digitization and the robotization will automate will automate specific tasks of a technical nature and the work of the human will then take another form to take a very concrete example to which extent could digitization automation help the life of a nurse will the nurse become unemployed no we don't think so but we have to see which task of a nurse or of a doctor can be done better by a robot and what other tasks task then could be taken over or even done better by, by the human? That is the nature of, of the question that we should ask. And otherwise, if we don't dare to ask these questions, then we still are weaving according to, to, to the old traditional methods. So I think we have to raise this question. It's a very important one, but it's a, it's a, general, a general political question. And this should not stop us from embracing this technology. But also with an eye on to which extent does the nature of the jobs of so many people will change and how can we accommodate this change towards these new technologies? Thank you for the question. Okay, good, good morning everybody. Thank you for the for the questions. Um, well, the the NPA is uh, is focused on aviation. I'm, I'm I'm a little bit surprised by by that because I, I thought we had tried to to uh, to address to address the drones. Of course, we have taken uh, very much into account the uh, the fact that the drones operate in a, in a in a context where you which is called aviation. And therefore, we, we had to address the, the, the risk that could be 
that could be caused to, to aviation, for example, the, the risk of uh, the risk of the risk of collision. So that's what we have what we have tried to do. And uh, certainly, maybe offline, I'd like to, to, to discuss with Dr. Meinberg uh, why he sees that as focused, uh, focused on aviation. But basically, we have tried to, to address the drones, but of course, in order to an address all the risk, we could not ignore that there was aviation, uh, aviation around. Do you want to okay, go on? Okay, yes, yes, now we have a question from Peter. If you can give the microphone uh, to Peter. <laughs> Everybody knows Peter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Peter, go ahead. There we go. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Caesar mentions a number of things here. I'm addressing to, uh, to you because you spoke. Hopefully, we will get an answer from this side. Um, there are a number of things mentioned in the presentation, specifically in uh, U3. Uh, and I don't see anything building up to having them. Now, we know that there are going to be calls for demonstrations. You have said that there are a number of R&D topics that still have to be covered. To be able to be ready, we have to launch them early. Uh, by early, I mean there, there's money available now for a number of calls. What is the process to fill them in? When are they going to be uh, allocated? Who is making the choices of the priorities with which the topics have to be dealt with? Because you don't have to be Einstein to understand that detect and avoid is not there. Uh, but it's going to be critical uh, to get it. I have not heard or seen anything concerning money being put on the table for detect and avoid systems for small RPAS below 25 kilograms. Millions have been thrown at uh, detect and avoid for big aircraft, but we all know that the, the urgency is for the small. Below 500 feet, above ground level, beyond visual line of sight. And if we don't have detect and avoid, we're not even going to get there. So where's the money? <laughs> where's money? I will just give the coon afterwards uh, to answer money question <laughs> because our money is coming from the commission. Yeah. But I would say that we will launch, um, I think, two more uh, very large uh, scale demonstration projects uh, very soon. Uh, and as well, we have nine projects working. Uh, we'll start to work uh, on uh, the different topics and mainly, mainly concentrating on U3 services. Because as I said as well, for U2, we need the demonstration activities. For U3, we need to have the research activities. And it's truly recognized in SGU, and that's why we need to also those resources that is available for us, financial resources, we will put them on the U3 service development and looking at that. We are also working now on the um, concept of operation, so we will see, because as I said, it's vision. We need to have the concept of operation in place as well to s really um, set up uh, the requirements for the services to really as well further trigger the our demonstration projects to understand what we really need from them. But of course, detect and avoid is the visible. Huh? But for some other services, maybe we need in the CONOPS have more specific requirements and then we can la launch the call for the quite specific issues. But it's very recognized in SGU from our side as the resources, financial resources we have for the drones because we have a, um, a lot of more and now we just recognize that uh, um, DG budget is cutting more money from SGU mm -hmm. next year so we should be really tight and looking where is our priorities but it's very well recognized from our side, huh? the U3 and I will give to Zakun, maybe he finds some money <laughs> for this. <laughs> 
money here. No, you must look at this slides and presentation and the blueprint in gender as a snapshot of what we were discussing in, in, in March, April. Since then, our, our thinking is evolving and, and is becoming more concrete. And we should be able to come up with more concrete ideas and a more concrete roadmap, which will direct then our ideas and our priorities. As you say, we must build up in a logical follow order the, the, the development of the different services. It will come, but give us a couple of months time so that we can, on the base of more concrete idea of how the use space could look like and how these services really could, could grow in the quality and in their capabilities, when we have a better idea of that, we, are, we will be better placed to direct the, the projects and the stream of money that will come, which will, of course, be too, too few, uh, like too little budget, but we must use the budget as smartly as we can. And we try to also advance those projects to make sure that we, we, we have valuable demonstrators but which really add value at European level. Okay, let me, let me go on to that. Question from the list. Uh, and uh, we picked this one, how does EASA foresee the integration of the open category drones in the use space? So what we can say, is certainly that looking at the first step, 2019, uh, the, uh, the services which the use space requires are registration, e-identification, and geolimitation, and those functionalities are already integrated by the NPA in the open category uh, drones. Huh? So this is a way of integrating drones of the open category in the use space. So, uh, we can take one more question. <laughs> Hello. Just one time, okay. Hello, my name is Ronald from Berlin Airports. Um, regarding to your answer to uh, concerning the registration, with you space, there's mentioned a pan-European identification and registration process. When I read the current MPA, I didn't find anything about a pan-European registration system. How do you deal with this in the MPA world? So, you, you, from my point of view, as I read it as an individual, um, I could read this. There is a registration principle for, for every US um, operator and drone, but there isn't mentioned anything that there's a, a system behind. There you, 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 you just, um, you just pr produce the, pr the principle, but you don't... Um, from my point of view, you don't uh, give answers to to the how. How do we? How do you see the the registration for 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 the drones? Uh, for us, uh, it's not it's not uh, contradictory what Yasa is saying. Why we put that for us really for you space and I think it's for you is quite understandable. Uh, if we want to operate and deploy you space we should have a possibility. It could be in each member state, but you sh we should have the possibility embedded to share the information and data. If you want to have the drone cross-border uh, operations, and without the drone cross-border operations, I would say what we are talking about, the emerging markets and business opportunities, it really does not make such a added value. So. I think that's the main message that when you are developing the, your registration system, you should think how you can share and also embedding security, maybe privacy, looking at those issues. But of course, uh, it's not uh, anything contradictory what Yasa is saying. It's just at your level, you should be responsible for that and you should start to think about that, how you can also enable your industry. Yes, I'm totally with you, but um, maybe what's what's the other opinion on this for from from the MPA side? Are there ideas on the current MPA version or, or the future MPAs for 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 link the use space um, pan European registration? Yeah, uh, you, you are right. There's there's a, a need to put more details on on the how how the registration should look like in the NPA. We have not changed the principle that aircraft are registered on a national level by member states, but we, we highlight that these registers need to be interoperable and that it will be an electronic register. So we, we 
we place the, the basis for the use space, but of course uh, we have to further develop uh, the, the, the details. Okay. Before moving to the next uh, topic, so uh, uh, Stefan, if you can uh, just uh, give an answer to the question, we have a, a very hot question on the slide, very quick answer to the first one, on the uh, detected and avoid and the BV loss. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Uh, a very good question. Um, w that's also an area where we, we have to uh, see where the, d where the details or how the use space will look like, what role the detect and avoid will play on board of the aircraft and how far the, the systems or the, the use space systems will provide these functions on through other means. But of course, we will have beyond visual line of sight operation before 2025. And there are different means to, to separate traffic to ensure that there is no conflict with other airspace users. And the basis is also already in the NPA with electronic identification. And we of course, we have to work on the standards how this can support BV loss operation in specific category. Okay, thank you. So now we can move to the next topic. So th uh, the next presentation will be from uh, uh, Yves Morier on the structure of the MPA and uh, the boundary between open, specific, and uh, certified categories. Well, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Good, thank you very much. So yes, uh, I will do a, a couple of miscellaneous topics uh, during this, uh, this presentation. They are listed on the listed on the on this slide. Uh. Okay. So I will I will try to speak closer to the to the microphone. Uh, Okay, well, just just a reminder, uh, we have produced two documents, one which is basically the NPA 21705A, and the document 21705B is a risk assessment supporting, supporting the, the NPA. The NPA itself uh, is divided into an, uh, an explanatory note, which provides some background and explanation on why we, we produce the NPA. Then we have a, what is called a draft cover regulation, which is probably longer than the usual draft cover regulations, because we actually have used that to, uh, to, to a bit give some so not explanation, but give an overview of what is contained in the in the in this document then we have two two parts us and x and x1 which is i could say the aviation part and the part mrk for market which is in fact describe uh, how a, a drone should be put on the market so part mrk is basically of direct interest uh, more for manufacturers or uh, importers uh, etc we have tried to, indeed, to also include a number of me acceptable means of compliance and guidance material, which are non-binding documents, but uh, which are supporting the, the NPA. Um, we have also included there the various leaflets that you found on the, uh, on the table at, at the entrance. Then a section is about how to support implementation. Some ideas were given there. A list of references. And we created one appendix in order to provide, in fact, a sort of mapping between the use space blueprint and the NPA. I'm saying this was done two, three months ago, so it probably would have to be a bit adjusted due to the latest version of the, of the blue space. But that was a, an attempt to show the, the consistency and maybe also to indicate that depending on how the blue space would be, the, sorry, the use space would be going, uh, we may need to adapt also on, on the NPA. Then the impact assessment that has basically been described by, or at least outlined by Alessandro in his presentation. Okay, these are the general articles. I, I will not get into all of them. We will be there for uh, quite a time. And a number of them will be covered by further presentation. So maybe 
one subject matter and scope, one point of interest is that uh, we are not addressing indoor uh, operation that maybe need to be needs to be reminded. Quite a long set of, uh, of definitions. Principles, uh, basically we speak here of the responsibility of the operator, the registration, the electronic identification and the geofencing. Uh, open category, specific category, we have a dedicated presentation to that, so I will not, I will not uh, dwell on it. Designation of the competent authority and the responsibilities will be addressed in, uh, in a specific presentation towards, uh, towards the end of the day. Uh, one thing we had to introduce, because we have, uh, I would say, the um, uh, introduced the C marking, is also to explain how uh, uh, market surveillance authorities are designated and what are their responsibilities. Exchange of safety information, that's I think quite fundamental to, to, to our work, and it's particularly important here, is that we will have aviation competent authorities, the market surveillance authority, both with gathered data, and it's important that they share it. Um, Third countries, third countries operator, basically we have said that they should comply with our rule if they operate in or in and out of the uh, uh, EU airspace. But we have opened the door to the possibilities of uh, agreement with the foreign authority to recognize some of the certificates. Means of compliance, that's uh, basically something quite standard, but it will be further developed uh, during the discussion on the specific category in relation with the, with the standard scenarios. Airspace area and special zones, that will be also discussed at uh, several opportunities during the, the next presentation. Exchange of information and safety measures, it's how to, 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 to react, and in particular indicated, indicating what the national authority or what ESA should do in that case. Operation conducted in a framework of model clubs that will be addressed in the discussion on the open category. Applicability, I will discuss it in a minute, and Article 16 is basically a sort of a administrative article. The part US contain, of course, a subpart on open category, a subpart on specific category, as I said, they will be described later on, and contain a subpart dedicated to the light UA operator certificate, which is an optional certificate which provides certain privileges. And importantly, you need to look at the appendices of that Annex 1 because they define the product requirement for the open category, so the elements that will be introduced into the CE marking and that need to be completed by a number of, uh, a number of standards. So they, they are uh, specified for each of the US classes specified for two functions, the geofencing function and the e-identification function or, or system. Part, uh, part market, so that will be further, further described, but I just wanted here to, to, to give a bit of a, an overview, so the general provision, obligation of economic operators, which are the manufacturers, which are the importers, which are the distributors, how conformity of the product is being done, that's, that's important to, to see that there is a particular section on that. The, what are the conformity assessment bodies and how they are notified. And then uh, section 5 containing several elements, including a union safeguard procedure, which allow to, in a way, if things goes really bad, to uh, ground the drone, in a sense, uh, nationally first and probably uh, European-wise afterwards. It contains also a series of appendices. I think it's important for the manufacturers to look at what are the conformity assessment procedures, and in particular in liaison with the one that we have, we have proposed, but Jean-Pierre will, will describe that in more details. Okay, oh, just a quick reminder. Open category, no pre-authorization required before conducting an operation, so the operator does not need an authorization. Of course, the drone needs to still have CE marking and the pilot have, when necessary, the uh, certificate of competence. The technical competence, the technical responsibility for the CE marking is on the manufacturer. In the specific category, well, there, uh, in order to, be, to, to perform the operation, you need to send either a declaration or to ask for an authorization. 
there as a risk assessment is covering, I would say, the design of the drone. So it's on the operator to uh, determine the compliance with the necessary technical requirement, of course, with the support of the manufacturer. So that's, uh, I would say, the bro broad differences between the two categories. When you look at the, the boundary, which is a question quite often called, the open category is defined by, uh, you could say, uh, five, four main limitations below 25 kilos, the maximum height of 120 meters, plus the possibility to go up to 50 meters above a higher obstacle that was introduced during the, the discussion of the expert group, operation in visual line of sight, and flight over assembly of people are not allowed. That's as soon as you get out of one of those limitations, you have to go into the specific category. But it's a bit more complicated, if I may say, in the sense that when you look at the subcategories, there also you can find some indication of boundaries. I will take an example. Uh, the, um, for example, the category A2, uh, which is flying close to people, contain a class called C2, which is limited to four kilos. So it comes clearly out of that, disc of that uh, element that if you want to operate close to people with a drone of 10 kilos, you would have to become uh, a, specific, a specific operation. So that's, I would say, the idea. So the, the, the big differences are on the four more elements, but there are some other elements, like the one I was, I was describing, to, 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 fur to completely address what is uh, the boundary between open and specific. Some words about the NPA applicability. Uh, it's certainly an important paragraph, and I would encourage you to comment on it. Uh, I would say my experience of being a rulemaker for 30 years tend to indicate that this is sometimes uh, not looked at completely. People focus on the technical detail, but this is actually indicating how much time you have to comply with the rule which has certainly direct implication on the amount of effort on the cost to be, to be put. So I will not get into much detail. Um, we had in that NPA Im imagined that we would have an adoption of the rule in 2018, that the um, applicability date, depending on what we are talking about, would be 2020-2021. The choice of two to three years was, in fact, taking into account that from what we have understood from manufacturers is that the, the sort of life of a production is around three years for a drone, so that was trying to, to, to make those dates co consistent with that kind of, uh, kind of number. But I, I one point I would like to stress that, of course, with new space coming in place in 2019, some of the elements we have mentioned here may have to be accelerated, notably geofencing, registration, and e-identification. But I would certainly encourage you to spend some time commenting on that and see the consequences on, uh, on your operation. Okay, certified category. We, we had uh, originally put a lower priority because uh, the development were obviously in the open and specific category, and that's where also where there were a non-harmonized situation. However, based on a number of comments on the on previous discussion, we have uh, put a higher priority to it now. We have revised the priority. We have started in 2017. The idea is to have an NPA by 2018. The proposal is not to create standalone rules as we have done for open and specific, but amend the current regulation. And we foresee at the time being that dedicated part on US would be needed for OPS regulation and for FCL regulation. The idea is to complete uh, the, uh, the opinions or ESO certification specification, so the, the, the material essentially to be delivered to the Commission by the end of 2018, early 2019. So this may be a bit ambitious, but uh, we, we will try to we'll try to fit to it. We have to remember that also during next year, we will have to uh, get to discuss the adoption of the opinion and to start looking at its implementation. What are the first considerations in order to, to answer to the, to the question certified versus uh, specific? So first certified means a category which has a certain high risk, I would say, 
Uh, and then we require the certification of the unmanned aircraft, of the operator, and the licensing of the flight crew. So it's an end. Certified category covers those three elements. The explanatory, explanatory note has proposed some examples. As you can note, we have not tried at the time being to uh, put mass criteria, but we have more tried in order to be in line with the operation-centric concept, try to define in broad terms operations that could become, I would say, uh, certified, and some examples are, are given here. We just highlight one, which is the U.S. use for transportation of people. We would see that as being certified. Perhaps a, a simple logic being that the comparable aircraft with the same capacity will undergo some form of certification process. Well, that was my, my last slide. So I think we have roughly 15 minutes for, for questions. Uh, I am adjusting a slide of question, Eve. And uh, if you can begin to take the free flex of convenience, operators going f uh, forum shopping for loop. Okay, well, my, my answer would be, I try to be short. For me, this is what we have called the third the third um, uh, country operator. So we have said they have to comply or unless we have agreement with the other authority to accept a number of requirements. So that's one element. If we think of, uh, I don't know, more intra-European intra issues, I would say first we, we have our national authorities that are, that are competent and we will introduce a standardization process uh, to, to look at how the authorizations are being given uh, in order to, to, to make sure we get uh, a, a reasonable, uh, a reasonable um, uh, I would say, fair, fair level. And the same, in my opinion, would apply for the look. It's an authorization, or sorry, the look. The it's an authorization which is given by the national authorities. We have developed a number of requirements. There will be a number of uh, of uh, guidance material to support it, and we will also have their standardization, standardization procedures in order to see how our member state implement the rules. So that would be my, in broad terms, so third country operators for the outside and internally, this standardization procedure, as usual, I would say, in, uh, in aviation. May also add that uh, the we require the organization uh, to uh, ask for a look in their a state where they have their place of business and where they are registered, so they cannot do not go to another state when uh, they are uh, an European organization. And we have a question about the market part, uh, and if it considered develop a similar application for a specific category. I well, I can try to give an answer, but will certainly refer to to Jean Pierre to that. I would say the NPA at the time being do not uh, require the, if I, my understanding, it doesn't require the CE marking. In fact, the technical requirements will be defined by the application of the risk assessment or the, uh, or, or the uh, standard, standard scenario. So that's basically how it is. So yes, there is, a, there is certainly a difference here in terms of uh, no CE marking, plus it means also that the operator, as I intimated had to look at the how the uh, the technical requirements will be will be fulfilled so we we considered at one time the idea of saying c marking complemented by something so if there is a c marking probably we can take into account what was in the what is in the c marking into the into the risk assessment jean pierre I think in my presentation, I will try also to clarify that. So if it's still unclear, you may come back later. That's right. I can take the next one. OK, the next question, I, it's about indoors operation. What is the limit? OK, I, I, I think if, uh, at, at the beginning, uh, our answer was OK. We, we are, uh, those rules are supposed to be in the European single sky. They still are. And therefore, it's difficult to say the single sky applied to, for example, this room. Uh. 
So that was, that was really the logic. The idea it would be supported by health and safety regulation, you know, to, I'm sure that if someone would like to operate a drone in this room, our colleagues from health and safety would certainly ask questions. Actually, we had the questions and we decided to operate outside in this little place. It didn't happen, but that was the, that was the idea to show, to show the demonstration. So the, it shows that health and safety would, would work. Now I, I recognize that the next point is, <laughs> I, I don't have a, a perhaps a, a complete answer on that. Um, I would encourage probably people to, people to, people to, to, to comment on, on, this, on this aspect. We have made a bit of a clear cut distinction at the expense of perhaps this kind of, this kind of, uh, of situation. So I, I would encourage to comment. We, we may need to look at it, uh, to look at it again. Continue. Yeah, maybe now we can take a question from uh, yeah from the room. If you can give the the microphone to Anna. somebody, <laughs> somebody uh, maybe on the, the left side here. Yeah. Okay, let's be democratic. This gentleman. Okay. At the end. Uh, Good morning, Marco Festa. I, I have a question about uh, uh, the geofencing and uh, the, the relevant requirement for the geofencing because uh, in this uh, situation where we have uh, an EU space that is uh, under development and provides just registration and identification and with, some with a lot of small drones continuing growing inside our flying environment, the geofencing becomes the most critical part. So the geofencing and our drone emergency systems for stopping, for example, at uh, 120 or 15 meters height. So how EASA intends to regulate this critical part of the unmanned, that is exactly the same if it's an open category or a specific category. The, the regulation should be more or less the same. Well, that's, if I may, that's one of the, one of it's a big challenge that we have in front of us. We have put some essential requirements into the NPA, so first, are they enough? Huh? And then the, the second element, but uh, that we, we as you may have seen in Kuhn's presentation a bit before, we intend to start uh, working groups. Um, we have not exactly defined uh, how those working groups would be constituted, but the idea would be that we need now to complement the elements that are in this, uh, in this appendix uh, to, to, in fact, prepare a mandate <coughs> for standardization bodies and get, and get the development of the, of the standards. And it's a very big challenge because, we, as, as you've seen, we, we need to be ready, probably, uh, early 2019, if we imagine that we have a new space uh, operational toward the end of 2019. So that's, I, I realize it's a process answer that I just give, but uh, to me it's a, it's one of the key challenges we, we need to, we need to face at the time being, and we, we, we will now make sure that we will get the necessary element for those mandates to work on the, on the geofencing and then try to, 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 to impress that priority into the, the standardization body. Well, we have already elements to start with. We had a task force. Uh, Euro-K has started to think, but uh, I, yes, it's a challenge. Your answer also answer to the first question that was put there on the slide. How, when, within, and uh, who will develop standards? You touched it. Here, here's the next question. Good morning. Jens Lehmann from uh, FATCA. I would like to know uh, something about the procedural uh, issue here. You will get hundreds, if not thousands, of comments to this NPA, obviously. So my question for you is, how is EASA going to condense all those and bring them forward into the NPA? And secondly, is it possible to get a mark on the side what is the change from the current first draft to the final draft to see what was included and what was not included? 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, uh, there I, well, I expect we will get a lot of comments, and, I, and in, in one sense that would be good. Uh, we will need certainly to, to group them, uh, to because there will be some perhaps with different sensitivity, but addressing the, the same questions. So probably what I what I would suggest is we're going to group them by big big topics. We will make an answer to those to those big topics, and then in the NPA, yes, we can try to introduce what were what were the changes, so it can be it can be detected. So I think it's. It's uh, it's doable. Uh, the problem will be we have to deliver all that by January 26, as my <laughs> my colleague will say later on. But it's uh, we will try to to make clear what was changed, both by grouping the comments uh, to by by sort of themes, and by putting uh, putting uh, indications into the the NPA by uh, probably a simple uh, a simple track change kind of kind of things. Okay, so two, two minutes. Yeah. One more question. Good uh, morning, Natalia Zutz from the EDA uh, Defense. <laughs> um, one question is: uh, EASA estimated the risk of collision between manned aircraft operating very low level in the cities. It's a concern of our uh, military member states, uh, especially when uh, dealing with a quick uh, response mission at low level above uh, the cities for interception, for example. So have you considered, have you studied uh, this risk of collision between the manned state or military aircraft and drones in the EU space? Uh, honest answer, not yet. Uh, we have been looking at uh, certainly the, the, the risk of collision between civil aircraft and the drones. We would expect that, okay, th there will be helicopters uh, coming in for emergency purposes to, to go to hospitals. There we can imagine a system of coordination between the, between the uh, po possibly the, 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 the person that, uh, that organize EU space and the drone operator. So we can imagine a, a system like this. Now we would have to probably look into more detail for a, a military interceptor coming uh, coming above a city. Honestly, that's something we have we have not uh, we have not looked into. But we can apply what we have proposed for. Uh, we may need it may be very short reaction time in that case. Uh, when for a, let's say an emergency helicopter, we may have a little bit of time to to, to address the case. Okay, we have another question there. Hi, um, Nigel Dunkley from the Civil Aviation Directorate of Transport Malta. Uh, one question for you. I still don't see a clear delineation between whether Class A or uh, Cat A ops can occur in controlled airspace. I don't see whether it's actually a boundary whether if you operate Cat A, you automatically become specific. If there is that, I don't see a clear delineation as to what is the option that the member states have to want to include Class A within the controlled airspace, especially for member states such as us in Malta, where our entire territorial land is controlled airspace. All I can say from our experience, we've been operating this for the last six years. We have an agreement on a management system with air traffic control that works and functions. But my biggest worry at the moment is, without having to engage the tools and the basic regulation, ideally, by triggering off Article 14 and blah, 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 um, where is that flexibility that gives the member states to allow Class A with an element of risk um, in controlled airspace. And the second question I have is for anyone on the panel on the table is, um, I was very happy to hear what Mr. Trevor Wood said in his opening statement about using technologies and drones and using that eventually for even for the manned aviation as a good uh, platform or a bench to do that. But then one thing that pricked my ear that maybe Mr. Kuhn mentioned was, and I quote, forget about the little drones. And, and my worry about all that is, is that as I'll piggyback on what maybe Peter's statement was before, there are millions of these things out there already doing research and development on technology they want to use, and I'll use these two words very carefully, for something bigger and better, because what is found at that platform with the smaller drones is what we can build up for something bigger and better, being the larger drones. So. I hope maybe Mr. Kuhn said that erroneously or he was thinking about something else, but obviously um, then Mr. Wood's statement and what Mr. Kuhn's statement was, they're pulling the rope in two opposite ends. 
My feel is that how ARs are got out of their MPAs is A and B because A is important and A comes first in the normal alphabet bit and B comes after. I understand the timelines are coming out at the same time, but that's just about it. Thank you. Okay, Nigel, I will carefully get away between a, a towing match between Mr. Woods and Mr. De and Mr. DeVos. I I don't have the pay grade for that. But coming to your question on the uh, controlled airspace, uh, I think what we, we need to do is to look at CERA. Uh, CERA contains a number of flexibilities in there to, to, to allow, I would say, this kind, uh, this kind of, uh, of operation. And I think we are going to, to start rather soon to work on the CERA in order to avoid that there are showstoppers for, for the drones. So I, if you accept, it's a very broad answer. I will not get into the details. But that's how I think it would be It would be solved. Now, if Kuhn wants to answer the other question, he's welcome. Thank you for the question and, and, and to let me come back. The point that I wanted to make is to really, what are we trying to regulate? And there is our focus should be on the underlying technology, which will be integrated first in smaller drones, but might, take, might be integrated in many other things too. We are looking at the car industry, but what will that uh, uh, imply f for the whole aviation industry? That's the point that I want to make. And to which extent are we automating tasks of, of aviation or air traffic management and so on? So what is the, the phenomenon that we are faced with? That was the basic issue that I wanted to raise with, with and, and then making the link to, to digi digitization and decarbonization. So what is the bigger picture that we should look at? And then, okay, of course, starting with what first, what uh, is our main priority? That, of course, are the, the, the open category of drones and the smaller part of the drone market. So I hope that that is the logic behind it. And let's now go. Yeah. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. So before the break, so we uh, ask answer to the main question now on the Zaido. Okay, that's a that's a tricky one. I, I will I will admit. Uh, I I remember that when we were discussing this uh, this concept of operation in, in our various document at the time, we said that an assembly was starting at around 10, 12 people. I think because the idea was that what you could expect as a queue, for example, to a, to a bus stop. Bon, okay, is that, uh, is that a good answer? I, 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 I don't know, and, uh, and I mean that's something which, uh, which we'll need to, we'll probably need to, to face that question. And I would certainly encourage people to, 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 to give ideas. I mean, I don't know if there is a scientific way to, to address it. One could imagine that when there are many people together, if a drone is coming, you will not have the possibility to, to duck or to, 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 to avoid the drone. But uh, I, I would not go further than that and would simply propose, okay, if there is good ideas in, the, in this room or if there is good ideas in the when commenting, we would certainly welcome to, welcome to, to, to take that. We, we could also try not to put a number but give some guidelines how to determine, but I, I don't have an answer for that yet. But uh, I agree, it's a point that needs to be addressed because we mention it, so we will have to, we'll have to answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we, we break, for, we have a coffee break. Uh, coffee break is uh, served on just exiting, you go just straight, and we will reconvene at 11.30. I forced Xavier to watch it. 